If you have your Bibles this morning, to turn to Deuteronomy 33. Let's look at Deuteronomy 33, verse 1, and then we're going to jump down to verse 6. It says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And you jump down to verse 6, and he starts into the, the blessings. And in verse 6, he says, Let Reuben live and not die, and let not his men be few, very brief, very short, very to the point, and uh, an interesting blessing that he gives Reuben. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that we can be here. Thank you, God, for helping us, Lord, and you let our vehicle start, and Lord, you just you just helped us to get here this morning. Thank you, Lord. Bless now as we look at your book. We pray, Lord, you'd warm our hearts. We pray, God, that you would help us, Lord, in a very lasting way this morning. Um, Lord, may we see thee as thou art, and may we rejoice in thee. In Jesus' name, amen. That blessing on Reuben, let Reuben live and not die, and let not his men be few. Um, this was the blessing that Moses gave, but many, many, many years earlier, there was another statement about Reuben. So if you want to keep your place there, and go with me to Genesis 49. Genesis 49. Genesis 49, look at verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Um, one of the things that's really interesting here, and of course in this passage he has the actual 12 sons in front of him. And um, he says, I'm going to tell you what happens to you in the last days. And, of course, one of the real obvious things is that means Israel will still exist in the last days. Um, several people have brought something up in the last couple months. And it's been really interesting. And it's, it's made me take a look at something that I've never even really given a thought that is, you will hear this. And so I, I, want, I want you to just consider something with me. You will hear about the lost tribes. You will hear that, um, you know, the children of Israel were lost historically and nobody knows who they are and all that. And, um, and so where does that come from? Where does that thought come from? Um, there's a lot of places that if you do any reading at all, they're going to tell you that much of Israel is lost. Uh, they'll tell you most of it is. Um, nowhere in Scripture is that stated. It is something that is assumed from a couple things. Um, the northern kingdom of Israel went into uh, captivity in Assyria at about 722 B.C. Okay. And... They, they say, well, once those tribes went into the northern kingdom, they were assimilated and mixed in with everybody, and, um, and so they were lost. So, again, that's an assumption. Um, but even the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah and Benjamin, was deported in 2 Kings 25. So, um, you know, really around that, just, just a little bit later, they were all dispersed. Um, 
And so they, they make the assumption that they were lost. Now, when you make that assumption, you, um, you, you're, there's a lot of scripture that you're not considering. Um, one of the things that shows up is many of these tribes reunite at a later point. But let's set that aside for a minute and uh, look with me at Luke chapter 2 for a moment. Luke chapter 2. You know, the, the, the final authority on what we believe is what does the Bible say? You know, it's not what does this guy say or what does that guy say? You know, what it's not what does history say? Because the Bible trumps history because the Bible is the only absolutely perfect history. You know, history for many years has cast doubt on various places and dates and things that have happened. But but the more they uncover and the more they uncover and the more they uncover, it just it just continually proves that the Bible is true on every count. Um, so look at Luke chapter two. And um, of course, this is at the birth of Jesus Christ and Jesus is eight days old. He's brought into the temple. Verse 36. And there was one Anna. The prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Acer, which is Asher. So here we are in the New Testament, and they still know who Anna is from. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke 1 verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. Um, you know who the, the priesthood was. The priesthood was the tribe of Levi. So here we are in the New Testament, and here's somebody that knows what tribe they're from. Okay, look with me at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, uh, partway through the chapter, there's a dispute among the disciples over who's going to be the greatest. And, um, and so the Lord begins to address that. And in verse 27, you see these words. It says, For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as one that serveth. Ye, ye disciples, are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the mixed up, mangled up group of Israel. That's not what it says there, is it? Who are they going to judge? Twelve tribes. And it goes on. Look at Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, although I don't know who I am. Is that what he says? Of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. He still knows who he is. That tribe's not lost. Look at Acts chapter 4. And actually, I'm going to skip a few verses. This thing shows up all over the place. Acts chapter 4. People say, well, all the, all the tribes were lost except the southern kingdom. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not belittling anybody that has believed that up till now. I'm just saying one of the things you see when you look at the Bible is that that is not true. OK, so look at Acts chapter four, Acts chapter four, verse 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles were surnamed Barb Barnabas, which is being interpreted, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus. So he's he's you know, he's one of those guys. He's not from Jerusalem, you know, he and yet he still knows who he is. 
In Acts chapter 26, Paul speaks of the 12 tribes serving God. In James chapter 1, James speaks of the 12 tribes scattered abroad. None of the tribes are lost except one. There is one that something happens. In the last place where the tribes are listed, and that's in Revelation chapter 7, um, you've got the listing of the 12 tribes, and that reference is yet future. There is a tribe not mentioned, and that is the tribe of Dan. That's the only one that appears to be lost. So the, the Israelites are still a people in the last days. The difference between Deuteronomy 33 and Genesis 49 is that, of course, Genesis 49, Jacob has his son standing right in front of him. And, um, and what Jacob says really is a look at the last days, whereas Deuteronomy 33 touches what would happen immediately and in how the family line would play out in the generations. One of the things you see also in Deuteronomy is that there are some things from Genesis 49 that were altered. There were some things that Jacob said in Genesis 49. And you see some of those, some of those guys from those tribes, they do something a little later on and it changes their future. Their future was not fixed. It was not written in stone. So I have a question for you. We just read Genesis 49. So here's my question. Did God inspire the words of Genesis 49? Of course. That was mighty weak. Let's try it again. Did God, maybe, maybe your lips are still froze. <laughs> Did God inspire the words of Genesis 49? All right. Were they doomed to their fate? I heard somebody say it. Ever so fearfully, Jenny Smetting said no. <laughs> Were they doomed to their fate? The answer is no. You know, there are people out there that would tell you that God has history sort of programmed. And, and God does have, you know, there is a, a, the plan of the Lord and it involves nations and kingdoms and there's times and seasons. Okay. But when it comes to people and their lives and their decisions and how their life plays out, it is not fixed. They are not doomed to their fate. And I want you to just look at a couple places with me. Look at 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23. Boy, when you read about Reuben in Genesis 49, and uh, we'll get there in a minute, but it, it does not look good for Reuben. In Genesis 49. But Reuben did something that changed his fate. Look at 1 Samuel 23. And um, David goes down and he rescues the folks at Keilah uh, from the Philistines. In verse 7, 1 Samuel 23, verse 7. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, bring hither the ephod. Then said Daniel, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? Remember, Saul, David has just saved their neck. 
And he says, Lord, are, are they going to betray me? And the Lord said, verse 12, they will deliver thee up. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went wherever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah and he forbore to go forth. In other words, he didn't go. So here's my question. Uh, David is, is talking to God. And I mean, he's not just, you know, having a feeling. He's just not reading a verse in his Bible that he thinks confirms his prayer life. I mean, he is, you know, it's that Old Testament thing going on. And the ephod was a means of communication with God. And he asked God a question and God himself verbally answers. He says, Lord, will the men of Keilah come down? The Lord said, they will. And David said, will they deliver me up? And God said, they will. Now I got a question. Did Saul and his men come down to Keilah? They did not. Was David delivered into the hands of Keilah, into the hands of the Philistines? Saul? He was not. But the Lord just said he was coming. See, some people have this in their head that, that God says something and then it becomes unalterable. And suddenly people are doomed to their fate. That is not true. Let me give you another example. Look at Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah 38. We could talk about Nineveh and how God pronounced judgment. But they were not doomed to their fate. Look at Jeremiah 38. It's a bad time for Israel, and, and uh, Israel is surrounded by the uh, Babylonians. And um, Zedekiah the king, I mean, the, the city's suffering from starvation. And Jeremiah has just been thrown in a dungeon, but the, the king gives permission to lift him out. And in verse 14, Jeremiah 38, verse 14, then... Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing. Hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? If it, 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 Jeremiah is saying, Can I even trust you? He's saying, You're so wishy-washy. He said, You just threw me in the prison, and now you pulled me out? He says, verse 15, and if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swear secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live and thine house. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hands." Verse 19, and Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand and they mock me. But Jeremiah said, they shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. And you guys know the story. Uh, Zedekiah let his fears get the best of him. And uh, he waited and waited and would not go out. For him to go outside that city, I mean, you know, he was going to have to trust Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, by the word of the Lord, even after God had decided to destroy Jerusalem, he said, if you will just walk out of this city and just go right up to him and say, we surrender, he said, you'll save your life 
You'll save your family. You'll save this city. It wasn't fixed. He wasn't doomed to his fate. You know, it was all going to hinge on what he did. What he did. Look at Jeremiah 49. Genesis 49, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together, and hear ye, sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my, thou art my firstborn. He addresses him first. He was the oldest. He said, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. He said, Reuben, that's what was yours by birth. You didn't have to do a thing to have that. It was yours. Verse four, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, thou defile, then defiledst thou it. He went up to my couch. You find that incident in Jer Genesis 35. In Genesis 35, uh, Reuben goes up to his father's concubine when his father is away. Um, you see it referred to again in 1 Chronicles chapter 5. It was a blot on Reuben's future from that day on. It, it sort of defined his life and it cost him the great blessing, the blessing of the firstborn, the double portion. There was a huge big deal that was yours if you were the firstborn son and Reuben forfeited that. You know, something that's interesting about that is um, none of that was forbidden until Exodus. Uh, in other words, it wasn't spelled out in black and white. You know, he goes up to his father's concubine. Well, you know, um, you, you get into the book of Exodus, which is later. And then God spells it out. You know, all these, you know, you can't, you can't, uh, you don't go into your father's sister and you don't go into yours, your, your mother's sister. And you don't, you don't go into your mother-in-law and you don't do this and you don't do that. And and the Lord spells it out in black and white. And he talks about all those incestuous type relationships. And, um, you know, it it wasn't spelled out. You know, a lot of people think because something's not spelled out. It's open season. That somehow, you know, maybe it'll be OK. You know, there was this one act. And man, did it ever cast a dark shadow on the future of Reuben. You know, sometimes one act, I'm sure that wasn't the only wrong thing Reuben ever did. Reuben was like the rest of us. But it does seem like sometimes there is there's a line that people cross. You know, the children of Israel, they provoke the Lord, they provoke the Lord, they provoke the Lord, they provoke the Lord. Until Numbers 14. And in Numbers 14, they do what they've done many times. But God says, this is it. We're not crossing this line again. And, and of course, you guys know what happened. This act defined Reuben's future. But in these verses, it seems that that act sprung out of his character. Look at verse 4. Unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel. He said Reuben was unstable. You know, the Bible says a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. And there was no blessing in this context. Now, in Deuteronomy 33, you know, uh, Reuben does get a blessing. But in Genesis 49, as he brings up that that immoral act that crossed a line with God, 
Um, it brought a shadow, and there is no blessing in the context for Reuben of Genesis 49. He says, Reuben, he said, you are unstable. He said, you are unpredictable. He said, I couldn't trust you. I couldn't turn my back. I couldn't go away from home. He said, you were unstable. He said, you were back and forth. Unstable means not fixed. You know, David, the, the man after God's own heart said, Oh God, my heart is fixed. What was it about Daniel? Daniel purposed in his heart and no weather was going to change that and no mood was going to change that and no argument with somebody was going to change that and no bad deal with the pastor was going to change that. His heart was fixed. You, 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 didn't, uh, you didn't wonder how long that decision was going to hold out. You know, it's been the mark of everybody that's ever followed God with all their heart. They and, and maybe they were unstable in their youth. I think, you know, children are. You know, but when I, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There's a place where you draw a line. You say, okay, I can't do this anymore. I got to, you know, we say we got to man up. Okay, I, I got to set my course. If I'm going to live for God, I'm just going to have to put my head down and fight the wind all the way and do it. Paul said, this one thing I do. It, it'd be good this year if you bury it way down deep in your heart that this year is going to be different. I don't know what last year was. Maybe you were unstable. Maybe you've been unstable all the way to, the, to this point. And God says, you don't, you don't have to be. God says, your fate isn't fixed. God says, if you'll, if you'll decide for me, it'll change everything. We sing that song. You know, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Have you decided? A lot of people in our churches, and they're not, they're not bad people, but you know what? They haven't done what Reuben did yet. But God looks down and he goes, wow, they're unstable. Unstable means not firmly established. Paul wrote, wrote to the Ephesians and he says, I don't want you to be like, he said, children tossed to and fro and carried with every wind of doctrine. When you're unstable, you're easily moved. You're easily shaken. You're easily diverted. And you know, we're not talking about being teachable. You know, it seems like there's always extremes. So you got the dude over here that's so stubborn you can't tell him nothing. You know, oh, they're stable because they're never going to change. But they're 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 in they're in a ditch way over here. And then you got the people that that are teachable. And then you got the people that just they don't know where they're at. They just keep bouncing around. We're not talking about being teachable. Um, we're talking about changing with the wind, changing with the crowd, changing with the fads, changing with your next new best friend, changing with pressure or with whims. Reuben was unstable and out of being unstable, came an evil act, one evil act. Oh, he had committed many, but suddenly an evil act sprung out of that that marked his future. But many years later, a blessing is given. Look at Deuteronomy 33.
And I have to confess, when I as I started reading this, at first I saw verse 6 as really negative. And somebody says, well, Pastor, that's just because that's the way you are. <laughs> but I, I have to admit, I, I read it. And, and no, I'm not really negative. I try to be really realistic, but um, actually I'm very positive. I, I'm very positive. I, as you guys know, I, I, I have no use for the gloom and doomers and all that stuff. But, but um, I read verse 6 and I thought, is this a blessing? Because when you read down ch through chapter 33 and you read some of the blessings that some of those guys got, there are some of those blessings that are several verses long and they're very detailed and there's spiritual implications. And Reuben gets this little one-liner. And there's no seemingly spiritual implications. And I got looking at that and I thought, is this a blessing? But my oh my. It was a blessing. It seems odd at first. It seems very generic. It seems very super, uh, very superficial. It's just such a brief statement, yet it points to something huge and deep, both about Reuben and about the Lord. All of a sudden, Moses speaks up and the sons of Reuben are there. And he says, this is the blessing where with Moses, the man of God, Moses is about to disappear. And he has the power to pronounce something that will cast a brightness instead of shadow. And he says, let Reuben live and not die and let not his men be few. One of the things about the word blessing is when you look it up, you could you, you see uh, one of the classic definitions in Psalm 115. It says, he blesseth them also so that they are multiplied greatly. The essence of blessing is always that something is multiplied. And he says, let not his men be few. You know what? Reuben did that really bad thing. And it, it isn't it's always the case that um, people always, you know, remember the bad. But they do. They always tend to remember that. If you've done something really stupid in your family or you got something, somebody in your family that's really made a mess, you know, when the family gets together, um, you know, or, or maybe when that that person is in the distance, it, you know, and you're, you're talking about this one and that one. And, and invariably that person comes up and, and you know what comes up is the blot, you know, the, or, or somehow it, it always goes back to, well, you know, you know what they did and, you know, this is what they get. And, you know, and then look at the mess it made. And, and, um, but there was something else that Reuben had done and Reuben had done something good while he lived. And his generations would now reap that something good. Go with me to Genesis 37. Let Reuben live and not die. In Genesis 37, Joseph has his dreams as a young man. And, um, you know, Joseph was the, the son of Jacob's old age and true to form, as is so often the case. When people have a child later on in life, they tend to dote on that child. They tend to spoil that child. You know, it's it's the baby of the family. And, and you know, it, it really is so predictable. You see it in so many families, you know, and, and the older kids will always say, yeah, Johnny gets by with murder and we got we got trouble for that. And they laugh at Johnny. And, and you know, you have you have that. And, and that was that was the case here with Joseph. It says it was very obvious that Jacob loved Joseph more than all the other brothers. And he made him a coat of many colors. And it says because of that, um, it says his brothers hated him. And could not speak peaceably to him. Then on top of that, he has two dreams. And in both dreams, the family is bowing down to him. And, um, and you know, he, he told them the dream and they hated him yet the more. Look at verse 12. 
Genesis 37, verse 12. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock at Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. The man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. No, that's pretty bad when, you know, um, you know, you, you've probably got some people in the family that nobody likes, but usually nobody sits around and figures out how they're going to kill him, like legit kill him. You know, they, they figure out ways to exclude them. They figure out ways to make him feel bad, you know. But th this is how much they hated him. They thought, you know, we're going to kill him. Verse 19. And they said one to another, behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some evil pit. And we will say, some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him. He said, guys, don't, don't hurt him. That he might rid him, verse 22, out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, the company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him unto the Ishmaelites. Now, Reuben must have been away from the group for a few minutes when this occurred. And his brethren were content. Verse 28, they're passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph in Egypt and Reuben returned to the pit. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit and he rent his clothes. That's what they did when tragedy struck. They rent their clothes. And he returned to his brethren and said, the child is not. And I, whither shall I go? Of course, you guys know the rest of the story. They took the coat, they dipped it in some blood, and they told their dad that an evil beast had devoured him. And, and um, uh, Jacob wept for many days, and, and he thought that he was gone. Look at Genesis 42. Now, many, many years have passed. And now Joseph is setting, really as the ruler of Egypt. He's second in command, but he's the ruler of Egypt. They do not recognize Joseph, but Joseph knows exactly who they are. Of course, Joseph speaks Egyptian, and um, he starts sort of playing with them and, and sort of messing with their mind and... and uh, and he says, how do I know you're not spies? Verse 15, Genesis 42, verse 15. Hereby ye shall be proved by the life of Pharaoh. Ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you and let him fetch your brother and ye shall be kept in prison that your words may be proved whether there be any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you're spies. And he put them all together into ward, into a holding cell. For three days. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, 
Let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, and bring your youngest brother unto me. So shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another. Now all of a sudden, they're talking to each other. You know, they've been talking to an interpreter. You know, and of course, they don't understand that Joseph understands every word they're saying. And so you can picture it. They sort of step off to the side. They've agreed to go try to get Benjamin and bring him. And look what they bring up. Look what's been haunting their conscience for 20 years. Verse 21. And they said one to another, we are barely guilty. They're, they're looking at each other and they're saying, this is our stupid fault. In that we saw the anguish of his soul, talking about Joseph, when he besought us and we would not hear, therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered, Reuben answered them saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he, Joseph, turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Well, you guys know the story and God blesses and, and it all turns out wonderful. And Joseph one day, you know, sometime later reveals himself. And um, But what you see here is what Reuben did. You know, they were going to kill Joseph. They were going to kill Joseph. You know, there's part of the story Joseph didn't even know. It was, it was Reuben that stepped in and said, let him live and not die. That sounds like Deuteronomy 33, verse 6. Let him live and not die. And the God of all grace would let Reuben reap the good. You know, it's just like God was looking down from heaven and he knew that Reuben's line was going to be cursed. And he knew that this shadow was going to haunt them for the rest of their future. And God looks down and he says, surely I can find something to bless. God is good. He's full of goodness and he's full of mercy and he's full of compassion. And he looks down and he sees the day that Reuben stepped in between and saved Joseph's life. And God says, Reuben, now it's time to reap something good. He said, Reuben, I'm not going to let you die out. I'm going to let you live. And you're going to live long. Let him live and not Die. You, ever, you ever think what a blessing long life is? You know, I don't I don't know, and I say this very carefully, and I don't mean to be foolish or callous when I say this. I don't think anybody in this room is facing a terminal illness at this moment. I don't think anybody in this room, unless you're unless you're really um, you know, people get sad and brokenhearted and they get they they go into despair and then they wish to die, but generally that's not normal. Um, people will rather do anything than die. People will fight till they're the last get go to live. Um, the Lord said in Proverbs 33, let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. I don't know. I just wondered throughout the history of, of Reuben's, uh, generations, I, I wonder if they were some of the ones that had the longest longevity. You know, eternity will tell. But wouldn't it be interesting to step into heaven and find out the Lord says, oh, by the way, you know, I, I really honored this more literally than you even know. And Reuben's, long, Reuben's line was filled with people that lived a long life. Psalm 91, the Lord said to the people that would Follow him, he said, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. He said, let him live and not die and let not his men be few. 
Now, sometimes this thing of a big crowd is very empty and shallow. You know, a crowd, a majority is often evil. Exodus 23, the Lord said, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Okay, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in there at. Churches, you know, um, and, and it happened, you know, in the fundamentalist churches years ago, they they really got concerned with numbers, big, big crowds instead of truth. And um, an interesting phrase shows up in Isaiah chapter nine. It says, thou hast multiplied the nation, but not increased the joy. So there is a side to that. And, and my first glance at verse six, I thought, well, this is really shallow. And this really isn't much of a blessing. But all that said, blessing is always about something multiplied by God's hand. In Luke chapter nine, Jesus standing there and. There's that crowd of 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And, and the Lord says, what do we have? And, and Philip said, well, you know, we've got five loaves and two fishes. And, and it says the Lord took those five loaves and two fishes. And it says he looked up to heaven and he blessed them. And then when he broke that bread, it was just multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. Why? Because the Lord blessed it. Look at Proverbs 28. You know, uh, there were certain family lines that God cursed and they just faded out. And God said, uh, Reuben, I'm going to let you live and not die. And he said, I tell you what, he said, your family line is going to be massive. Let not his men be few. Look at Proverbs 28, verse 14. Okay, I wrote the wrong verse down. So let me give you, what's that? Yep, there you go, 1428. I wrote it backwards. I had a dyslexic moment there. <laughs> Proverbs 1428. In the multitude of people is the king's honor. But in the want of people, the lack of people, is the destruction of the prince. You know, it calls our Lord the prince of the kings of the earth. You know, there's some people that they get this idea. Um, and I've, I've, I've heard it said here, not recently, but I've heard it said here, you know, that the church, you know, grows a little bit. And, and I remember a lady said to me one day, she said, oh, she said, I hope it doesn't grow very much. And, and she wasn't being weird about it. She she didn't mean that foolishly. But she said, she said, I, I just hope it stays small so that we can, you know, all just it, it just stays real cozy, you know. And, um, you know, I, I can appreciate what she was getting at. Um, and I understand that thing of, um, you know, people that want numbers for the sake of numbers. We certainly understand that that that's foolish. But you know what the Lord does? Um, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It says, and the number of the disciples was multiplied. Man, the church strikes off at Pentecost. And, um, and you know, it's 3,000 one day, and then it's 5,000. And man, that thing is rolling. Um, you know... Um, God adding to a church, it, it, if it's the Lord, you know what that is? <laughs> that is a blessing. Look at Ezekiel 36. Some people have this mindset that, um, well, you know, if, uh, if, if, if a church starts growing, you know, there's got to be something wrong with it. And the Lord is blessed. I mean, good grief. Our church started, this church started 
you know, in 2012 in our living room. And it was my family and uh, three other people, the first service. And, um, you know, it's, it's grown. And if we, we've always said if we kept everybody that had ever been here, you know, we, we certainly wouldn't be in this room. You know, we'd have we'd have 200 people. Look at Ezekiel 30, Ezekiel 36, verse 33. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the wastes shall be builded and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, the land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. You know, Reuben was ruined. And God said, and Reuben was going to be desolate. And God said, you know what? I, I think I'm going to change that. I, the Lord, verse 36, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, watch the words, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. As the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem, in her solemn feasts, so shall the way cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. You remember when the Lord wanted to bless Abraham, what he did? He took him out, and he said, lift up your eyes to the stars. He said, count the stars if you can. And he said, so shall thy seed be. Why was it going to be that way? Because God was going to bless it. God is going to bless it. Reuben, I want you to live and not die. Just like way back, you know, when you did that for Joseph. He said, Reuben, you're, you're, you're a mess, Reuben. But he said, but I look back and I see something you did where you saved somebody's neck. You stepped in and it was righteous. And he said, Reuben, I'm going to let you reap the good. What a blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it'd, be, it'd be a good thing if this year you'd sow some good. You'd sow some good. There's probably some of you in this room, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know, but I, I just know how the devil is. He's the master of discouraging words. He's the master of robbing you of hope and of brightness. He's the master of always reminding you of where you failed and where you blew it and where rightfully you should be marked for the rest of your life and a shadow should follow you all the days of your life. But he says, if you're so good, surely mercy and goodness shall follow thee all the days of thy life. He said, if you'll sow some good, he said, I'll water that crop. You know, why is it we always think that God wants to pour on the worst? God says, I'll pour on the best. He says, I'll water the good plant. He said, why don't you sow some good this year? Why don't you do something definite for the Lord? Like quit the, quit the back and forth and up and down. Quit the unstable. And just put your hand to the plow and say, Lord, the plow, sowing. Put your hand to the plow and say, I've been a mess and I've fooled around and it's been a lot of nonsense and I've played around a lot, but I am going to stop all that. I can't undo the past, but I can sow some good. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap. God says, I'll water that crop. God says, if I bless it, it's going to grow. Amen. If I bless it, it's going to grow. One act. Oh, how much power sometimes is in one act. Proverbs chapter 5, 
is that 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 big passage where Solomon talks about the strange woman and how you ought to avoid her and all that stuff. And he comes to the end of that chapter and suddenly Solomon says, he says, he says, he says, you don't know how close I came to that cliff. He said, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the assembly. In other words, he said, you know, there, there's a cliff there. You know, there, there's a place. There, there's, that, there's that line that marks a shadow on the rest of your life. And Solomon said, even as I write these words, he said, I remember when I almost went over that cliff. He said, one more. One, he said, I don't know. But he said, maybe my next act would have cooked my goose forever. One act. But I want to close with this. Go to Ezekiel 18. And to me, this is one of the most amazing passages in the Old Testament. And it speaks volumes about our Lord. You know what the Lord wants you to do this year? He, he doesn't want you to give up. He wants you to look up. He wants you to put your hand back on the plow. He wants you to remember that he's the son. And the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wing. Be merciful unto us and bless us and cause thy face to shine upon us. I don't know if there's a bunch of darkness in your past. I don't know if there's some deep scarlet thing there. But God says, yeah, he says, I, I know it's there. But he said, I just want you to know your fate's not sealed. My mercies are new every morning. God says, you're still living. Your fate's not sealed. For to him that is joined to the living, there is hope. God says, as long as I live, I'm the God of hope. You got a hopeless voice kicking around in your head telling you why you can't serve the Lord and why it'll never work. And it, Hey, tell the devil goodbye. Look at Ezekiel 18. I love, I love, I love this passage. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Verse 21. A real sweet three-letter word. But... But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Let Reuben live and not die. He shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness, God says, I'll just, I'll just swallow it all up in righteousness. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord, and not that he should return from his way and live? You know, that was Old Testament. That was before Jesus shed his blood. You know, that was before, if we confess our sins, he'll... He's faithful and just. That was before all that. That was in a day when really there wasn't much hope. Man, you, you got way out on a limb with God in the Old Testament, and you were in trouble. You're in trouble. And God says, but you know how it is? He says, you know how I am. God says, that one act, I saw Reuben and the mess that he was. He saved Joseph's life. And God said, God said, I think I'll just park right there. In his righteousness, he shall live. One act. Hey, you know, God's looking, God's patient. And, and God, he waits that he might be gracious. You know, sometimes he's just waiting. He's waiting for you to, just to stop the fooling around thing, get that unstable thing, and just say, okay, Lord, I'm just going to. Lord, I don't even know if you'll accept this, but I'm just going to haul off and do this for you. And that one act 
changes a future and a family forever. Why not? There might be somebody in here and you've been planning something really stupid. You know, maybe suicide or maybe leaving your wife or leaving your husband or, you know, robbing. So you, you, you've been planning something really stupid. And, and you know what? That one act that. Wow. That's going to be a curse to you forever. But you know what? It's time to do. It's a new year and you're still hit, sitting here and there, there is mercy with thee. There's mercy. And you know what he's saying? He said, instead of doing that, he said, why don't you just do the opposite? Why don't you just haul off and do good in its place? Instead of doing that dumb thing, why don't you just say, Lord, if I did what you wanted me to do, what would I do for you? And he'll tell you, and you can haul off and do it. And you know what he'll say? He will bless you. Let Reuben live and not die. And let not his men be few. What a God we serve. Let's pray. Man, you talk about blessing somebody that didn't deserve it. You say, I don't deserve it. Yeah, none of us do. But he was looking for a reason to bless. You know what he's doing with you this morning? He's looking for a reason to bless. Why don't you give him one? Lord, may we live this year under the sunshine of your blessing. Lord, help us to get out from under the shadows that haunt us and that torment us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Lord, you are good. And we are thine. And Lord, you want to bless us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help that person in this room that's just on the verge of doing something really dumb. And God, help them to look up and say, Lord, do you have a blessing for me? Because, Lord, we know you got them. Lord, would you help somebody in this room? Lord, help several somebodies here today. In Jesus' name. As the piano plays, if God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to him? tell you if you look up toward heaven and you call his name he's going to hear you and he loves you would you call his name this morning yeah he, he knows where you are why don't you call on his name